Welcome to tonight's debate webinar. Sorry, I think we might have had a little bit of an audio problem. Um, but just to explain a little bit about how tonight is going to go, um, I am going to pop on right like I'm doing right now, um, and I am going to explain a little bit about what um, tonight is all about and how you can use our debate webinar platform. So as you can see, we've got the chat up here. So I just typed in hi. Um, that chat box is going to be for you to um, just say hello, um, say where you're from. Um, you can use it to talk about um, what we're talking about. You can also use it to talk amongst yourselves. Now, there will be a Q&A box as well once we move into the um, presentation. Please only use that for questions um, because then they'll be used later on um, in the webinar. Um, so we really need to make sure that that's only the question. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Mr. Eric Gomez. Uh, Eric Gomez is a policy analyst for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. Here he is. <laughs> um, his research focuses on U.S. military strategy in East Asia, missile defense systems, and their impact on strategic stability. and nuclear deterrence issues in East Asia. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree in international relations from the State University of New York College at Genesco, um, and a Master's of Arts in inter International Affairs from the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. Um, so he's highly qualified. He's the best in the field. Um, and I know that you guys are really going to learn a lot from him. So I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to his presentation. Um, and then you guys can go ahead um, and start learning. As you can see, we've got the chat box on the right, top right. We've got the questions on the top left. So all right, Eric, I'm going to go ahead and give it away to you. All right, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on here tonight. Really excited to talk to you all about uh, missile defense systems on the Korean Peninsula. Um, so, yeah, we'll just dive right into it. Um, I'm going to start off by explaining. There we go. I'm going to start off by uh, just explaining the broad technical details of how missile defenses work. Um, I hope not to, you know, make your eyes gloss over too bad. Um, with this description, I just want to give a general overview. So missile defenses are used to protect uh, areas or specific locations from ballistic missile attack. Um, some of these systems are capable of intercepting uh, cruise missiles or aircraft, notably the Patriot system, um, but mostly we're interested in, you know, what can these things do against uh, ballistic missiles. Um, most of the systems are hit to kill, which means that they slam into incoming warheads or missile bodies at high speed. Uh, the best way to intercept these, uh, to intercept the ballistic missile is to hit the warhead uh, either head on or from the side. Um, or, you know, if you can't do that, you can hit the missile body itself if the missile does not separate into multiple stages when the warhead is coming back down. Um, but that one, there's no real guarantee uh, the, of destruction of the warhead because sometimes uh, what has happened in the past is that those interceptors successfully hit the missile body, um, but the warhead continues to fall through the debris cloud and ends up striking the Earth. Um, sometimes, though, if you get a hit on the missile body, the warhead could tumble and disintegrate when it tries to reenter, um, or it could uh, be thrown off course by the force of the blast. Uh, when you're talking about conventionally armed ballistic missiles, uh, that's pretty good um, because those need to be relatively accurate to their target. But if it comes down to nuclear systems, um, you know, the difference in if, if a missile falls a few hundred meters away from where it was supposed to fall, it's still going to do a lot of damage just because of the size of the um, explosive effects of, of nuclear weapons. Um, miss, missile defenses used to be nuclear armed back in the Cold War. The United States and Soviet Union both fielded uh, nuclear armed interceptors, which sounds pretty crazy to me. Uh, but now they are mostly, if not all, hit to kill. Um, moving on to the sensor systems, there's a variety of sensors that are used to guide uh, the missile interceptor towards its target. Um, 
the first, I have the order a bit mixed up there. The first is our early warning satellites, which detect uh, the plume of a missile lifting off, usually through infrared sensors. Then there's ground-based radars that uh, create a, or ground-based radars create a sort of smaller search area. Uh, so they narrow down where is the warhead or where is the missile. And then the infrared seekers on the missile interceptors themselves have the responsibility of uh, homing in on and destroying uh, the target. Um, so there's a lot that goes into successfully intercepting missiles. Uh, and the longer the missile flies, the more sort of the sensors you need to have in order to properly cue all the different parts of the uh, missile defense system. Finally, the US missile defense system is layered. Uh, this means that there are different missile interceptors and systems that get shot opportunities um, at different segments of flight. If you can see here in the, uh, in the presentation, let's see if I can draw something here. Okay, so you have the, I don't know if you can see that. All right, there is a, uh, this segment of flight right here, it's called the mid-course segment. That's when the missile is, up in outer space, uh, and if it's a multi-stage missile, this is when stuff is separating from the main missile body, and the warheads are starting to separate. Um, the ground-based mid-course defense system and the Aegis system can engage targets in the mid-course segment. The other segment of flight where U.S. missile defenses can engage is over here on the right-hand side of that chart called the terminal segment. This is when the missile is coming back down to Earth um, and re-entering the atmosphere. Uh, missile defense, missile defenses on this end are the FAD batteries and the uh, Patriot system that can be used. Um, yeah, they're, they're used to intercept in the terminal phase. Um, not every interceptor will get a shot. Uh, for example, the FAD system cannot shoot at an ICBM, um, but it does mean that there are, there is something to defend in pretty much defend against every single type of ballistic missile um, in multiple parts of its flight. Uh, so, yeah, that's what, it, that's what is meant by layered. Sometimes you hear layered missile defense, and I think the assumption is that, oh, every system can get a shot. That's not necessarily true. It just means that for a wide variety of threats and at a wide variety of stages of flight, there is something optimized to intercept. All right. So this is a um, good illustration of all that I just went over. So you have here, on the right-hand side, you have different types of missile def or of ballistic missile threats from short um, on the left to I see some short-range missiles on the left to long-range missiles on the right. Um, and then you have all the U.S. parts, all the parts of the United States missile defense system on the left, which would actually intercept them. Um, Patriot, Pac-3, uh, or moving right to left, you have the Patriot system right here. That is capable of intercepting short-range ballistic missiles uh, as they come back down to Earth in the upper layers of the atmosphere. FAD, to the left of it, we'll get into FAD a bit later, but that's good for anything from a short-range to an intermediate-range missile. But outside the atmosphere, it can only engage at 20-kilometer um, altitude, or no, 40-kilometer altitude or higher. Here is the Aegis system, mostly mounted on warships that can engage anything from a short range to an intermediate range missile in the mid-course phase or up in outer space. And finally is the GMD system, which engages intermediate or intercontinental range missiles, the two longest ranges of missiles, uh, higher in the Earth or higher um, up in outer space. So that's a brief overview of how missile 
defenses work. So now we'll focus specifically on <clears throat> uh, missile defense systems in South Korea, because uh, I know that y'all are going to be working on legislation or uh, mock legislation looking at South Korea. The big one that the U.S. has deployed is THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System. Uh, this system is relatively new. Negotiations for its deployment began in early 2016 after a North Korean nuclear test, and you know, we've all seen the news about how North Korea is testing multiple kinds of ballistic missiles um, with pretty high frequency in, in recent months and recent years. Um, so the THAAD system consists of several components, a radar that is uh, relatively small and mobile, um, six truck-mounted interceptors, and I believe each truck can fire eight interceptors and battle management components to tie in all the systems together and actually, you know, that houses the people that actually operate it and uh, choose when to shoot at incoming missiles. Um, based off of THAAD's deployment location, um, it is ideally situated to, yeah, okay. Um, based off of THAAD's deployment location, it is ideally situated to defend the southeastern city of Busan in South Korea. And I'm going to pull up a map on the next slide and sort of point out where all this stuff is. Uh, Busan is an essential port facility. It is where uh, U.S. or Japanese follow-on forces would land on the Korean Peninsula in the event of a longer conflict. Um, so that's what it's meant to do. SAD cannot defend, um, it cannot protect Seoul uh, from a ballistic missile attack. It cannot defend Seoul from rocket artillery attack, um, which has been brought up recently in terms of uh, North Korean threats to turn Seoul into a sea of fire. Uh, that would primarily be done with short-range conventional artillery. Um, you, they wouldn't have to use ballistic missiles to do that, although they probably would. Um, what else about that? The radar associated with it operates in two different modes, um, a early warning mode and a um, terminal guidance mode. The early warning mode has a much longer range but less uh, clarity on the targeting picture. Um, and that's used in early warning mode. Uh, the radar is used to provide information to other components of ballistic missile defenses to help it get a better shot. In terminal mode, the THAAD radar uh, has a much shorter range, but a clearer targeting picture. And it is used to provide targeting data to the interceptors that it launches. Um, there are two uh, TIPI-2 radars stationed in Japan that are both, uh, they're both just the radars by themselves, uh, no interceptors associated with them. Those provide early warning over the Korean Peninsula, and the SAD radar um, at the site in southwest South Korea uh, is used to um, provide terminal guidance for the interceptors. Although uh, it is possible to change the mode of this radar in a relatively short period of time, I believe it's on the order of a day or two. Uh, you can switch it from one mode to the other. Um, and this has really concerned the Chinese, which I can get into in greater detail if we have more time. Uh, my, my big current research project is looking at how systems like that and other missile defense systems impact uh, Chinese nuclear thinking. So, Happy to talk about that at length later. Um, okay. Yes, that's all I had on that for this slide. Next slide. Where is all this stuff? Okay, so I hope this, uh, well, some of you can't see the map. Okay, so if you have the, the Korean Peninsula, that is deployed in the southwest corner of it right here. Okay. Oh, no, that's not where it is. Right there. Um, I can't remember the name of the city, uh, but it's deployed on a golf course. Um, and the sort of white shaded area on that map 
indicates what its radar band is like. Uh, so it's not a 360 degree radar. It's, I believe, 145 degrees uh, that it can see. And those white range rings are out to 500, 1,000, and 2,000 kilometers. Um, so the radar has a much greater range than the interceptors. Um, the radar can, uh, ah, yeah, I see a question about uh, the radar on the golf course. I think the, lo the location was chosen, I think, one, to defend uh, South Korea, or one, to defend uh, certain air bases and port facilities in southeastern South Korea, um, and also to, I think, mollify some Chinese concerns about what the radar could see into, in terms of its ability to see into northeastern China. Um, or was I? So the radar, oh yeah, yeah. So as you can see though from the radar coverage here, um, it's very vulnerable to an attack from the side. And when North Korea was testing its submarine launch ballistic missile um, last year, that was a concern that was raised by other missile defense experts and North Korea experts is <laughs> that is great for a missile attack coming towards southeastern South Korea from North Korea. Um, but if they got a submarine out into the Sea of Japan or the East Sea, they could fire an SLBM from the side and ruin that day in a hurry. Uh, so that's one concern about um, the FAD location in terms of the limitations um, surrounding it. And, okay, another question here. Can FAD defend against low altitude attacks? No, it can only defend against ballistic missiles at high altitude, uh, specifically ballistic missiles above 40 kilometers in altitude because the missile, um, the FAD interceptor uses an infrared seeker to home in on its target and the heat of the air around uh, the interceptor is too hot below 40 kilometers. It used to be higher than that, so it's um, so the view out the window for the IR seeker is cool enough for it to pick up um, the heat coming off of warheads. And that's how that's how missile defenses home in on their targets. Uh, they go out and most of them go out into outer space and see the relatively hot warheads um, against the back against the background of outer space. Uh, so that's how it works, and that's why it would not be able to defend against low-altitude attacks. Um, the Patriot systems might, and we'll get into the Patriot when we uh, get to what the South Koreans have in South Korea. Okay, so this illustrates how the FAD radar works. Um, on the left is the forward basing mode, uh, so it sees a launch early using some information from early warning satellites. It tracks the missile as it travels and then provides targeting data to other components of the missile defense architecture so it can engage it. On the terminal base mode, which is what the mode will be, um, more, what most likely the mode will be in South Korea itself, the radar needs to uh, look through the threat cloud or the, you know, the field of warhead and debris and all that other stuff that is out in outer space when the missile is starting to reenter. It discriminates, so it tries to find out, okay, what piece of that um, threat cloud is a warhead, and then it tells the FAD interceptor, or and then the battle management software tells the FAD interceptor where to fly, uh, so that way it can intercept the warhead itself. Um, let's see. The FAD radar is definitely capable of providing early warning data to uh, the GMD in Alaska, which defends the U.S. homeland against missile attack. Uh, the, a radar of the same type that is used at THAAD um, was recently stationed in, oh, not Guam, but Wake Island uh, during a test of the GMD against an ICBM target um, in May of 2017. And it was more or less the same configuration in terms of distances that what what yeah that you would see in an ICBM attack from North Korea against the United States, and the FAD radar provided targeting data to the GMD. So in terms of Chinese fears of FAD radar uh, being used to negate its own nuclear missiles, there's probably some truth to that at the technical level. Um, 
but we'll get into that in the question and answer part. Uh, okay, so that's the radar. The interceptor of FAD itself engages in the terminal stage. So this is, again, as the missile is coming back down towards its target. Um, but it engages at very high altitude. That's where the um, HA uh, in FAD comes from, um, HA high altitude. Uh, it can only engage at altitudes of 40 kilometers or higher. I'm not sure what the maximum altitude is. And FAD interceptors only have a lateral range up to 200 kilometers. So based off of where the FAD is deployed in South Korea, if you draw a range ring of 200 kilometers around it, it does not cover Seoul. Uh, at that, at 200 kilometers, the missile will keep traveling, but it will not be able to effectively maneuver to actually hit a warhead with, with any guarantee of success. Um, so that's, that's uh, what it does on the interceptor. Oh, in terms of its, uh, the range of things that FAD can handle, uh, everything from a short range missile to an intermediate range missile, it is intercepted in testing. It has the best testing record of any component of the missile defense architecture. Uh, its record is 100%. It has, I think, 15 intercept tests, and it is successfully intercepted in every test. Um, one concern, though, about the FAD seeker is that, uh, so when it gets out in outer space and it's looking at incoming targets, it sees essentially points of light in outer space. That's the heat coming off of the warhead and other things that are reentering um, or about to reenter. And it cannot distinguish distance beyond a certain, like uh, 100 kilometers or something. So that means it needs, it needs to look at all those points of light and somehow find out which point of light is the warhead to ram into. And one way to mess with that is to cause your missile to break up as it comes back in. So that way, instead of just seeing just one solid missile with the warhead attached or just the warhead but no missile body, FAD is looking at, or the FAD interceptor has to look at one bright light that might be the warhead and then five or six bright lights that might be chunks of the missile flying towards it. Um, and in that situation, that's a very hard thing for the, for the interceptor to do as it's coming uh, towards it. So there's, there's lots of ways uh, to mess with the FAD system. Um, some other ways could be uh, blowing up a nuclear weapon in outer space to blind the radar temporarily um, and mess up its, its firing control. Um, you could shoot at it from the side with a submarine launch missile. You could try and hit it with an airstrike or some other uh, means to disrupt its radar. So it's certainly, it is a very impressive system on paper, uh, but it's certainly not without its limitations. Um, I see some folks typing in the Q&A, so I'll just I'll hold on for that until we see. Uh, why is something low altitudes? Tricky equally. On the second question, the FAD being developed enough so it's not easy to be tricked, um, some of this just has to do with just general physics. Uh, in general, missile defense, it, missile defense is playing the losing game, right? Because missile defense is incredibly expensive to make work, and if you're dealing with nuclear weapons, then you need to make sure that you can intercept as many incoming targets as you possibly can. It is relatively easy for the other side, in this case North Korea, to build more missiles than FAD could handle. Um, and this was a debate that raged throughout the Cold War um, where there was concern about, you know, the United States developing its missile defenses um, leading to Soviet counter moves that could uh, easily defeat them. So I think that there are ways to uh, continue to develop FAD to make it more accurate. Uh, to improve it, um, and that might increase its efficiency, but until some breakthrough is achieved, which allows the United States to build many, many, many interceptors for very cheap, um, 
getting to a point of sort of perfect missile defense is not going to be very realistic. And when dealing with nuclear weapons, you need to be as close to perfect as possible because the margin of error can be so devastating. Uh, for the other question, why would South Korea need that if North Korea is much more likely to attack at low altitudes? Uh, that deployment had a lot to do with politics, uh, alliance politics between the United States and South Korea. Uh, South Korea, the old South Korean president, really wanted to have that. Um, the new South Korean president was a little more cautious about it. It is a very controversial political decision to deploy it. Um, and we can get into domestic politics of missile defenses later, and that's a whole, that could be a whole other weapon. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that is limited in what it can do. We can't defend Seoul. There are some things that the South Koreans have that are capable of engaging missiles at lower altitudes that could defend Seoul. I'll get into that um, actually on the next slide. Um, but for some things like the uh, rocket artillery threat and the uh, conventional artillery threat to Seoul, uh, I think the South Koreans have chosen to defend against that with better uh, counter-battery radar. So these are like uh, truck-mounted systems that detect incoming projectiles and then figure out where those missiles or where those projectiles are coming from based off their flight path. And then the South Koreans can launch their own ballistic missiles or uh, rocket artillery to neutralize those positions. So that's how South Korea, I think, is going to try and defend itself from the North Korean artillery threat. Finally, the disadvantages of FAD being in South Korea. The primary disadvantage, well, um, well okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a few here. Um, one disadvantage is that because it can't defend Seoul, uh, some people would say, well, what's the point of having it in the first place? Um, another disadvantage, uh, which I've written about before, is called a perverse incentive, uh, where you have a missile defense system stationed in South Korea, and nominally speaking, you would say that's only defensive, right? But if the United States decided that North Korea was being too much of a threat and we needed to take out Kim Jong-un's nuclear weapons on the ground before he could use them, then if you don't have a missile defense system, well, well, okay, you're never going to get all of them. It's very, very difficult to have a perfect first strike that leaves no nuclear weapons surviving. So you're going to have to deal with a retaliation. Without SAD in South Korea, um, let's say you get 50% of, of Kim Jong-un's nuclear weapons on the ground. So you have to deal with about 30 coming back at you. Um, not including, you know, different types of missiles that could be mounted on, whatever. Uh, so you have to deal with a response. If you don't have missile defense, then that response is prohibitively costly, right? But if you do have missile defense, then your first strike doesn't have to be perfect. It only has to be good enough. And the U.S. could probably do good enough in, our, in its own mind. Um, where the missile defense, where Thad could soak up the retaliation and protect U.S. bases in southeastern South Korea and Japan, and preserve them enough to continue the fight. Now, I don't think that that um, so that so then Thad almost becomes an enabler for offensive action, where if you didn't have it, offensive action would be prohibitively dangerous, but if you do have it you reduce the danger of the retaliation, and so your offensive action looks more attractive. Um, again, this, you know, this sort of exchange really played a role in the Cold War, where the Soviets were worried that even a not very good U.S. missile defense system could be good enough to uh, limit damage to a certain point where the U.S. could contemplate striking first. Um, now, I don't think that that is how the current administration, the Trump administration, views missile defense on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you get into a point where tensions are even higher than they are now, and a crisis is really threatening to escalate, then there could be, that could come into play, right? It's like, well, you know, you could see someone coming to Trump and saying, well, Mr. President, 
um, we wouldn't be able to survive a retaliation or we don't want to attack because we worry about the ret retaliation, but we have that in South Korea. And the losses would be steep, but we could deal with them. And if the alternative is go to war or not, or if, if the, sorry, if the administration has already ruled out a peaceful solution, then missile defenses could make offense more attractive. Um, so that, that, that is, in my mind, the primary uh, disadvantage, if you will, of that, is that uh, at an operational or technical level, it's great. But at a sort of strategic and political level, um, it could create these perverse incentives for the U.S. to escalate a crisis um, in the hopes of in the hopes of winning. Um, so, all right, good questions, guys. Good questions. I'm going to move on to the next slide now, looking at South Korea's defense systems. Um, so, South Korea primarily has a mix of what are called Patriot Advanced Capability, or PAC, uh, PAC-3 and PAC-2 missiles for short-range defense. Again, like SAD, these are terminal systems that intercept as missiles come back down to the ground, but these intercepts happen at much lower altitudes. I believe um, that, or Patriot can start intercepting at 20 kilometers or lower, and they don't use infrared seekers. Uh, they use radar seekers because, <clears throat> excuse me, because the missiles are already coming back into the atmosphere at that point. Uh, Patriot systems are made by the United States primarily, and they are widely distributed to our Asian allies, including South Korea. Uh, they're also in Japan and Taiwan, and probably Australia, although I'm not sure. Um, so that's, that's one sort of suite of systems that the South Koreans have handy. Um, they are also interested in developing their own missile defense systems uh, called the Korean Air and Missile Defense, or KAMD. Excuse me. Um, these systems are supposed to be independent of U.S. missile defense. Um, they include, so the KAMD program is just sort of a blanket term, and the components of it include uh, their own land-based radars for early warning and missile guidance, uh, ship-based interceptors and land-based interceptors to actually do the job of slamming into the missile. Um, right now, it's a mix of South Korean technology and foreign technology. For example, the, uh, the missiles associated with the, with the KAMD are South Korean-made, but the radars, especially the, uh, the Green Pine radar, which is used for early warning, is actually an Israeli system. Um, the, I got some handwritten notes here. Um, so the KAMD is expected to come online by 2020. Uh, its deployment has been rushed up a bit based off of the North Korean threat, um, and it emphasizes only terminal defense. Uh, some parts of the U.S. missile defense system can intercept in mid-course out in outer space. These are the uh, SM-3 interceptors on Aegis warships and the ground-based mid-course system in Alaska. Um, South Korea doesn't want any of that. because South Korea doesn't need any of that. They need to deal with short-range threats primarily, um, which, good news for South Korea, are relatively easier to neutralize because uh, of the sh slower re-entry speeds of those warheads. Um, and it's also it's easier to do. The technology is more proven. Uh, so that's the good news for South Korea. Um, they might be able to ask the United States for help. Um, I am less versed in the nitty-gritty details of various South Korean missile defense systems, but I think production, mass production of some of the interceptors um, is just about to start uh, by the end of 2017. And there may be opportunities for United States defense firms uh, or the U.S. Missile Defense Agency to provide some sort of interface with the South Koreans to help them get their systems off the ground um, and help them, you know, build up. Um, that could be something for you all to pursue in your legislation that you're working on, um, something authorizing level or something authorizing specific exchanges between uh, the United States and South Korean uh, militaries to help uh, 
basically get the South Koreans to um, improve their missile defense architecture. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I suspect there is some cooperation already, um, but I'm not sure what that cooperation looks like. Uh, so something for you guys to consider. Uh, let's see. Oh, SAD is supposed to patch the vulnerabilities of the KAMD because it's a more capable system. It can intercept at higher altitudes. Um, and again, KAMD has various surface air missile systems. Uh, and our early warning radar, ship-based interceptors, and yeah, I think that's all I have for there. Uh, in general, the South Koreans are very interested in maybe not becoming more independent of the United States, but having their own sort of systems that they could use that are built by them um, and developed by them uh, so that they're a bit less reliant on the United States. Uh, so KAMD is one part of that. That's for missile defense and air defense. The other two big projects that the South Koreans are working on is something called Kill Chain. Um, Kill Chain would target um, North Korean missiles on the ground before they could be launched. And I believe for these, for Kill Chain, uh, the investment is primarily in uh, air, strike aircraft, land attack cruise missiles, and conventionally armed ballistic missiles. The other part of this, um, oh, sorry, and Kill Chain also targets uh, Kim Jong-un and other members of the North Korean leadership. The other system that the South Koreans are building is called KMPR, the Korea Massive Punishment and Retaliation um, System, which is designed to uh, retaliate against North Korea if they were ever to attack in an overwhelming fashion. Um, essentially burn North Korea to the ground uh, and burn Pyongyang to the ground as a, and I think the hope is that by threatening to do that, uh, that raises the risk for Kim Jong-un to escalate. Um, so it keeps him in his box. All right, moving on to my last slide, which is good timing for entering the Q&A. Um, so the politics and strategy of missile defense. So sort of taking a step back from all the nitty-gritty technical stuff. Um, one thing I sort of alluded to earlier is the offense-defense balance um, and how it does not favor missile defenses because missile defenses cost much more than ballistic missiles, and it's very difficult to have a perfect defense, and when you're dealing with nuclear weapons, you need to be as close to perfect as possible. Um, I think uh, this was very the, – the, the, the really good illustration of this that I heard recently was that someone said, oh, well, the United States used the Patriot system to intercept the drone. And the drone was about $400, and the Patriot system, like the missile itself, was you know in the hundreds of thousands or even low millions of dollars. Um, and you can see how that would be not very, that, 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 that doesn't leave you in a good place, right, um, in terms of what you can buy with that kind of money, what sort of defense trade-offs are you making to expand missile defenses. I mean, it sounds like the South Koreans are willing to afford the high cost of missile defense um, and also spend money on other conventional systems, uh, all the power to them. Um, but when you have to make the trade-off, it's, it's a little bit of a tougher call. Um, also, the perverse incentives of missile defense that we talked about earlier again, uh, that missile defenses could provide a sort of shield for a pre, uh, preemptive attack. Uh, this was a major concern, again, going back to the Cold War of, yes, you know, you, you know, I think the Soviets would say to the Americans, you know, yeah, you say that missile defenses are a shield for you, but really, you know, a better shield means that you can strike us with your sword or your spear and with, like, more confidence that you won't be hit yourself. Uh, so these systems are not so easily conceived of as defensive. Um, and that really plays into concerns with the Chinese. Um, it also influences North Korean nuclear doctrine. So the North Koreans have a very small arsenal um, and it's very vulnerable. So when you have a small and vulnerable, vulnerable ar arsenal, your best option is to threaten to escalate as soon as you can in order to 
um, discourage your adversary from escalating in the first place. And this is pretty much exactly what the North Koreans are doing right now. Uh, they don't have like an official document on it that I'm aware of, but if you look at all their statements about how they would use their nuclear weapons in a crisis, they all link them to if we detect an attack is imminent, we will go first with our nuclear weapons. And the hope is by threatening to do that, that the United States doesn't take a first move in the, in the first place. Um, and missile defense plays into this because if the North Korean retaliation is ragged and it can't get through a missile defense shield, well, then the North Koreans need to, again, that speeds up the timeline the North Koreans are working with um, so what you have is a very dangerous crisis situation. Um, finally, uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, missile defense is a technological solution to a strategic problem or a political problem. I think the United States really loves this. <laughs> American is apple pie um, to say that, uh, all right, so you have a problem on the Korean Peninsula of you have North Korea with nuclear weapons. We really wish they didn't have those nuclear weapons and we need to figure out how to prevent them from using them. Um, so instead of trying to sort of come to terms with the fact that North Korea could deter us, uh, we are going to plus up missile defense as much as we can to reduce our vulnerability as much as we can, and then you don't have to engage with the bigger strategic problem, or the bigger political problem of North Korean nuclear weapons. Uh, it's a very American way to... I think approach conflict. Um, I don't think it's a very good way to approach conflict, uh, but that's just my opinion. Um, and yeah, okay, so that's that's it on my uh, presentation. Uh, I will, you know, we have about a little less than 15 minutes now for Q and A. So, oh, Maddie, I'm sorry, but the Q and A. Um, may have been moved. There it is. Okay. Uh, President Moon. What is President Moon's opinion on that for South Korea? This has been an interesting question to nail down. So in Korean domestic politics, THAAD, the, the decision to deploy it was heavily associated with Park Gun hee who was the former president. And she, when she was impeached in disgrace, <laughs> Uh, the overall opinion of the FAD deployment decision went way down. I don't think it ever, I think the majority of the South Korean people have supported FAD, but it came close to like a 50-50 split on approve versus disapprove when it was the height of the impeachment scandal. And then when Moon came into office, the military, he, he I think the liberals in uh, South Korea have some trouble with the military and getting the military to do what they want, um, uh, what's called civil-military relations. Um, they aren't as smooth as they can be in the United States. So when Moon discovered that, you know, the military sort of rushed up the FAD deployment decision um, in order to get some stuff in place before the election, because during, ele during the campaign he was relatively negative about that, um, I think Moon really didn't like that. <laughs> and so he went ahead with this environmental review, quote unquote, environmental review uh, to sort of slow roll the process. But now he's, I think, more on board as North Korean missile testing has continued. Um, so I think Moon, I don't think he likes that, but I think he views it as an important part of the U.S.-South Korean alliance and the U.S. commitment to South Korea. And then um, I think he also sees that the more that North Korea actually tests the missiles, the greater the need is to have something, even if it's not a perfect defense. At least there's something there to provide a, a measure of reassurance to his people. So I think that's Moon's opinion. I think that's where Moon is. Um, it's a, not a static position. It's something that's changing with the times. Um, but I don't think that there is any, uh, you know, chance of FAD being reversed or the deployment decision being rolled back in the near future. Uh, does North Korea have any type of anti-missile defense? I don't think so. Um, I know a lot about North Korean ballistic missiles, but I don't know much about their other systems. Uh, 
a lot of their air defense systems are derivatives of older Soviet technology, um, with some of their newer systems being a bit more capable. Um, but I don't think it's anywhere near. Uh, the, the U.S. is really the best at missile defense, and, this, and the Israelis are also very good at missile defense. Um, and, you know, allies of Israel and the United States who have the technology are, are more capable as well. But I don't think the North Koreans have any real chance of, of limiting damage to themselves via missile defense. Um, but their air defense network is very dense in terms of just how many sites they actually have, even if, it's, even if they're older missile defense sites they could still probably do a number on attacking forces. Do you think tackling the political problem with the diplomatic solutions is more effective than military events? I, I think in the long run, yes. Um, so the problem, the main problem with Trump's approach to North Korea is that you have these very broad sanctions that are being levied, and the campaign is all about pressure, right? The problem is that if you have something that's all about pressure, but there's no obvious path for North Korea to reduce pressure or to, you know, get an out or take an off ramp, then, oh, and also if the stakes for North Korea are existential, they're not going to want to take the off ramp, right? If the option for North Korea is we either have nukes and we survive or we give them up and, we're, and run the risk of being overthrown by the United States, then they're going to cling very tightly to those nuclear weapons. No matter how much external pressure you put on them, no matter how much missile defense you put in, they're going to cling harder. And I don't think that you get to a different place with North Korea politically unless there's some sort of negotiation. Now, what that negotiation actually like, would look like, very hard to tell. Um, and I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, but I, I think that you know, that I, I think that's the ultimate, the, the long-term solution that doesn't have war in it um, is, is probably probably that route. So, oh boy, lots of questions. Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. And the South Korean can, yeah, I, I think the South Korean economy can, economy can handle the cost. Um, and politically, as the North Korean threat grows, there's going to be greater... Uh, pressure to do something about it militarily. Um, is it true that, yes, that is out of range to protect Seoul? Uh, if you draw a range ring out from the golf course where it is deployed um, out to 200 kilometers, the effective range of a THAAD interceptor, uh, Seoul falls just outside of it. Some of like the southern and southeastern uh, suburbs are covered, uh, but not the main part, and not the parts that are closest to the DMZ. Um, are there environmental harms to that? I'm not sure. Uh, there might, there may be something with the radar um, and electromagnetic radiation, but I think it's relatively minimal. Um, but I'm I'm not an expert on the environmental impact of it. Can you talk about China's response? Ah, yes, Chinese. I love this. Uh, so my big research project has been focusing on China's nuclear forces and how they react to U.S. missile defense development. And the important thing to understand about China is that their nuclear forces are very small. They have maybe 200 to 250 warheads across their whole arsenal, almost entirely delivered by ballistic missiles, and those 200 or so warheads need to deter uh, India, Russia, North Korea, the United States, and U.S. allies. Um, so it's a very, there's a lot of pressure on the system. And there's all these, um, it, it's very interesting about how, you know, China developed its nuclear weapons in order to, uh, you know, why did they pick that size? Uh, why do they have such a restrictive doctrine of nuclear use? Um, for example, the Chinese have what's called a no first use doctrine, which means that they have pledged not to uh, threaten to use nuclear weapons first in a war. They would only use them in a retaliation. Um, and their operating protocols are pretty indicative of that. Um, so, like, when the Chinese train, they only train under conditions where they're wearing mop gear, which means they assume that they've come under attack already. Um, they do not mate their warheads to delivery vehicles, so they keep them sort of 
uh, they keep the warheads either at bases a few kilometers separate from their missiles themselves, or they keep them at central storage at a specific military base um, and then have to move them to their missiles in times of conflict. Uh, but the United States, so as the United States increases missile defense system, um, systems for both regional and homeland contingencies, the Chinese have been very worried about the viability of their nuclear weapons in the face of these improvements um, because we could probably destroy a lot of China's forces on the ground um, in a first strike and then mop up the rest with the retaliation. So the Chinese are left with two basic options. Build out their nuclear forces um, and just increase the number to overwhelm missile defenses. Or they can introduce a degree of ambiguity into their nuclear doctrine in order to essentially scare the United States out from escalation. Um, I think they're going to do the second thing uh, based off of a whole other analysis and um, you know, the, the Chinese don't want to arms race the United States. We already have too much of an advantage. Uh, it would take away money from conventional missions in their military, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a host of reasons why they won't do, why they won't just build out. Um, the problem with adding ambiguity into your nuclear doctrine is that crises become really dangerous um, because we don't know if we don't know where China's red lines are. Their assumption is that we won't cross any in the hope of avoiding an escalation. But that assumes that we are not willing to, to risk escalation at all. And I think that's a false assumption on the Chinese part. I think that if there was a, a conflict over Taiwan or, or some other area that started getting out of hand, the Chinese would feel a lot of pressure to sort of reach for nuclear options. And in general, this is a policy issue that is, that is not the only reason behind it, right? I think that and China's reaction to it was emblematic of a bigger problem or, or a bigger strategic issue. Um, oh, sorry, the second option from China, uh, introduce ambiguity about its nuclear red lines in the hopes that the United States does not escalate any crisis for fear of crossing them. And this enables them to keep their arsenal relatively small uh, which and keep their doctrine still nominally no first use while hollowing it out. Um, so some examples of a hollow no first use pledge is that uh, right now the Chinese assume that we would have to attack them with a nuclear weapon in order for them to use their nuclear weapon uh, or weapons. Uh, but they might say that a conventional attack against the missile base could count because they couldn't be sure of what follow-on attacks would do. Or if they started losing their radars and ability to communicate with one another and that interfered with command and control, um, then they would face a window of opportunity to escalate or risk losing their deterrent completely. Um, and it's, this, is a, this, this general issue of you know, how does missile defense impact China and how would U.S. and China interact with one another in a nuclear crisis is something that has gotten some attention in academia um, and if, you know, you'd like, I'd be happy to provide some articles for that. Um, but it's something that really isn't discussed very widely in government circles when talking about, excuse me, when talking about the uh, U.S. response to North Korea. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I'll try to do these rapid fire. Given, Japan, given Japan's decision to rule out the deployment of a THAAD system on Japanese soil, was the expected Japanese reaction... Uh, so Japan is not ruling out THAAD. Um, they are considering THAAD or something called Aegis Ashore, which is basically uh, the, the module from the Aegis combat ships uh, mounted on the ground. Um, Aegis Ashore could provide total coverage of Japanese territory uh, with fewer sites, which means less money. Um, but the Japanese have also been in talks to purchase THAAD systems from the United States. So they could have both, or they could just have one. I think that they're leaning closer to Aegis at the moment than THAAD, uh, just because of the money um, and the coverage issues. Uh, but, yeah, so they're, they're not ruling out anything. Um, can you provide any details on the South Korean export events? 
I cannot provide details on that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if these are things that will be up for export or not. Um, with Chinese backlash that that outweighs the benefits of keeping and deploying more systems in South Korea, I I wonder about this. Um, and I think I think it is an understudied question, and it deserves more attention. Um, I'm not sure. I think a lot of it depends on where is the U.S.-China relationship going in the long term. Uh, is the U.S.-China relationship going to be characterized by more conflict or more cooperation? And I think if, if present trends hold, there's going to be less cooperation and more conflict. And I especially worry about what happens in the Taiwan Strait when the military balance between the U.S. and China is less clear and something happens that, that risks a conflict, right? And I think the Chinese are assuming that the United States will never, is not willing to escalate a conflict over Taiwan because we don't have as much at stake. And I think that fundamentally misreads how the United States would view such a crisis. And the big worry among IR scholars on this is if the Chinese start losing that conflict, do they reach for the nuclear option as a means to say stop or as a means to reverse their prospects on the battlefield? Um, and this doesn't have to necessarily be a nuclear use. It could be a uh, demonstration shot, like a detonation out in the desert to, to signal to the United States, hey, slow down. Um, but then you get into all these questions of crisis signaling and a whole other body of literature. And it's, I, I think it's, it's underappreciated and it's very risky. Um, so I think the backlash could outweigh the risk. But at the bare minimum, there needs to be a public discussion about the risk. And I don't think that's high up on the agenda of, you know, missile defense advocates right now. Um, possibility of reunification between North Korea and South Korea? I mean, I hope so. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I hope so, but uh, I don't know how likely it is in the current climate. Um, I think we'd have to do a lot of work to sort of de-escalate things before we get to that point. Um, a couple more minutes left. Is MAD a deterrent to North Korea? Well, we're not really in MAD. So MAD means mutually assured destruction. And the U.S. could without a doubt destroy North Korea. North Korea cannot destroy the United States, but the balance of stakes are different. Um, so North Korea, it's a matter of life or death and a matter of survival. And for us, it's not. Like, if we had to, we could live with a nuclear North Korea, right? Like, just like we live with a nuclear... Uh, communist China, and a nuclear Pakistan, and a nuclear India, and a nuclear Russia. Um, you could live with it. Uh, deterrence could hold. It wouldn't quite be mad, um, but I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of deterrence theory here, because I could talk about it forever, and it would bore you. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that... Um, uh, oh, let's turn up on the time. Um, I, so I think the deterrent model is different, but deterrence could still hold. The question is, part of deterrence is acknowledging the fact that you are deterred. And I think that is a big psychological barrier for the United States, especially with North Korea. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think the threat of retaliation does deter them, um, and I think our conventional capabilities deter them. Um, and yeah, so I think deterrence can hold uh, with North Korea, but it's not mad. Can Trump push the nuclear button without congressional approval? Yes. Trump can do that theoretically anytime he wants. Uh, the U.S. nuclear command and control system is set up so that the president can order a strike as they see fit, uh, but most presidents wouldn't just do that because <laughs> um, the obvious risk of retaliation and, and you know the danger that it could the dangerous precedents it could set. But yeah, you know Trump could do it. Um, Nothing stopping him on that. Finally, given that that is largely ineffective to the North Korean threat, why is the South Korean government to deploy more bad batteries? Yeah, it's partly security theater. So the, the deploying more batteries, it was more a matter of um, uh, deploying batteries that were already sort of sent over but not, like, fielded yet. It's a bit of a 
minute distinction. But, um, and I mean, FAD is effective at protecting a good swath of South Korea. It's just not the, uh, it's just not as effective against defending the capital. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think part of it is also just alliance politics, right? You know, China, or not China, um, alliance politics where FAD uh, is an important indicator of cooperation um, between, the, between the United States and South Korea, generally speaking. Final question. Uh, where can we find articles for the Chinese red line ambiguity? Yeah, uh, so the, probably the best one on this that I've seen um, is uh, an article by Caitlin Talmadge out of George Washington University called Would China Go Nuclear? And it examines a hypothetical conflict scenario over the South, or not South China Sea, sorry, uh, the Taiwan Strait and discusses, okay, if the U.S. had to target certain command and control or certain communication facilities as part of its conventional fight against China, what are the risks that those strikes could degrade China's nuclear retaliatory capability? Um, and there's also, there, there's a few other articles from the same journal inter, called International Security um, that, are, that get into this issue as well, and I'm happy to share those with Maddie so she can pass those on to you. Um, but yeah, those are the best places. And again, the type of stuff that I talk about with the Chinese is that is discussed in academia, but not really discussed at the public level. I, I went to an event with, um, with with someone who was a big missile defense advocate, and I asked them the question of like, you know, how does these missile defenses aimed at countries like North Korea and Iran impact the sort of long-term prospects of U.S.-China or U.S.-Russia stability. And their response was essentially, well, you know, they know that the system is not meant for them or, or that, you know, we don't have to worry about it just because of the technical limitations of what the system can do. And they are right, but I don't think the Chinese care. <laughs> um, sad is no threat directly to Chinese, it cannot intercept any Chinese missiles unless the missiles are flying towards the FAD battery. Um, so it shouldn't worry them, but it does. But they do military exercises simulating attack, massive ballistic missile attacks of conventional weapons on FAD batteries. Um, they write about it constantly in very authoritative sources. Their strategists worry about it when they talk to U.S. Um, you know, US inter interlocutors uh, in strategic stability negotiation. They do care, uh, even if the capability is not that good. So I think it's important for that discussion to make its way into the public space. So, all right, uh, I think that's it on the time and the questions. Maddie, are, are you going to hop back on for the end here? Or? Can't, can't hear you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Another <laughs> audio problem. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, this has been so helpful. Um, I think everyone is going to be um, very able to debate this and talk about it very educated um, now. So, all right. I'm going to go ahead and switch to our survey page. Now, everyone here, if you guys could just take a second to fill out this survey. Um, uh, I see someone has already started, which is awesome. Um, that would be super helpful. Um, and then we're going to go ahead, and as you guys saw in the chat, um, we're going to post the YouTube video sometime this week, um, which is a recording of this. Um, and then we're also going to have some resources um, from Mr. Gomez. Uh, uh -huh. We we will be able to post those in the bio, so it's all in one place. It should be really easy for you. Um, and feel free to reach out to me um, by email if you have any questions um, or um, would like to find out more about debate webinars. Uh, my email is mcarper at billofrightsinstitute.org. Uh, that's m-c-a-r-p-e-r -E at billofrightsinstitute.org. So, all right, I'm going to, um, Eric and I are going to hop off the cameras. We're going to let you guys do your thing, uh, fill out the survey. Um, but like I said, uh, thank you so much for attending.